Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on That All Might Be Edified Discussions on Servant Leadership. I'm Keith Pankow, and I have the amazing privilege to be here with Rock Ette. Rock Ette was born in the village of Sa'asai, in the island of Savai'i, on the independent island nation of Western Samoa. At the age of 13, in the eighth grade, he sat and passed a government high school entrance exam program designed to help Samoan school children to continue their education at a high school of their choice in New Zealand. His high school choice was based on living arrangements with distant cousins and relatives willing to become guardians for him during his high school years in New Zealand. He graduated from Avondale High School in 1989. He played rugby during and after high school with the aspiration to play professional rugby for the New Zealand All Blacks. At 22 years old, he chose to serve a two-year mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Hawaiian Islands. After his mission, he moved to Salt Lake City, Utah and started school at Ensign College, which was formerly the LDS Business College. In January 1996, he met his future wife, Jennifer Farrell, who was a previous guest on the podcast. So if you didn't get her episode, go back and listen. It was a wonderful episode. They were married in September of 1996. He then graduated with an associate's in June of 1998. He continued for many years to work on his undergraduate degree and graduate programs at the University of Phoenix and completed an MBA in December of 2009. Rock's professional background has been in business-to-business sales and eventually to high-level complex business development roles. He currently is the business development manager for Entergy Louisiana, the largest electric utility in Louisiana. Jennifer and Rock have been married for almost 27 years and have four children. They live in Denham Springs, Louisiana. They are faithful and active members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, welcome, Rock. So excited to have you on the podcast today. Thrilled to be on, and I appreciate the introduction. That's uh, some quite, I didn't realize, quite accolades there, but I appreciate that very much, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just love your dedication to learning and growing, and I Just like I talked about, Jen, the first time I met you was when you were out volunteering to spread the knowledge of the BYU Pathways Worldwide program that could expand educational opportunities to many people that didn't have an opportunity to get a high-level education at a really affordable rate. And I just find that so remarkable. And I think ever since I've known you and gotten to know you even better, I've seen this desire to learn and grow in yourself and also to help others learn and grow. And I reading your bio, it seems like there's always been this element inside of you to learn and grow. And I want to know more about that. Did, was that always there? Did it develop? Tell us and the listeners more about where this desire to learn and grow came from and what your earliest memory of that is. Sure. So I, I, I was always an inquisitive child. So I'm the ninth of 10 children and the youngest of five boys. And I was very close to my father. So In the islands, it's uh, very common to see your father when he goes to village council meetings with the chiefs and you'll have his young son tag along and carry his his stuff with him. So I was always accompanying my father uh, on those trips. I was very close to him. And then through those walks from our house to the village council, I would always ask questions just like any typical young person. I would ask about the sky, the sun, the trees, the birds. And uh, he was always such a willing teacher, and he was able to impart so much knowledge. And perhaps at the time, I didn't fully appreciate that, but that was really where it all started. I distinctly remember one time I was standing at the beach, and in the islands, I mean, you, you do think that your entire world is, is in that island. I mean, you, you, if you don't know anything beyond the horizon, it's your island is your world. But I remember the first time I noticed I was standing at the beach where we were harvesting clams and I would see an airplane fly through. And, and if you're standing looking towards a horizon where the sea meets the sky and you see an object come through it, if you're just a, a, a small young person living in an island, you don't know where that comes from, then you start wondering. Of course, once I knew where airplanes come from, I kind of learned. But that was one of the first things that intrigued me was where are these vessels and where these planes coming from and what part of the world do 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 these people live in and so when i started school and i started learning geography i absolutely enjoyed learning about the different land masses around the globe what they are where they are and then in in relation to my tiny little dot of an island it was 
almost overwhelming to think there is a massive world out there beyond the horizon. So at that very early age, I, I started yearning for what is beyond the horizon. And, and I know I use that phrase a lot, but there is something that is applicable to that need to see what's beyond the horizon. And are you confident to go beyond the horizon? And also being able to face what's beyond the horizon. And so I, I think there's a, a life application to that. But that's really where it all started for me. And so, of course, once I got on the plane and I flew to New Zealand by myself, I was sitting, looking through the, the, the airplane windows and I see my eyelids slowly disappear. And I think, man, that's almost gone. But when I was there, it just was a massive island. And then finally, when we arrived in New Zealand, I saw these massive buildings, the skyscrapers, uh, concrete roads, uh, interstates. I mean, it was just a, a huge transformation to see that. And so from there, of course, and then, and then going to Hawaii and arriving in the, in the U.S., and this is just a massive country. And so for me, it's always been there. Uh, even now at, at, uh, at my age, I, I'm always curious and inquisitive about things in life. Yeah, I love that. And I love all references to the sea and analogy. So I, I think we'll explore that a little later and that, that thought about the horizon and, and look into the horizon and, and what that teaches you because it's just a wonderful thought. Tua Avai was a previous guest on the podcast and still currently he holds the, the lead for most downloaded episodes. He's a resident of New Zealand with Samoan heritage and mm. a great guest. And he talked uh, a lot about some of the heritage as well. And I, I, I couldn't help but thinking about similarities you share. And, you know, he talked about going back to Samoa in kind of the reverse order because he grew up in New Zealand. And I, I, it's interesting to get your perspectives as you grew up in Samoa and then moved to New Zealand. And I'm, I'm curious more about these council meetings. What did you learn from attending these council meetings with your father that you learned about leadership at such a young age? The concept of a village council is really, it grew out of, of a, obviously, deep history in trying to solve problems in a village setting. So if you can imagine the way we're set up here in the US, you have a, a national government and then a state government and then a local government. In the islands, all affairs handled at the village are handled by the council. And rarely would you see the central or uh, central police or even the central government be involved in those decision making. So everything from passing laws such as uh, curfew when we have evening prayers, or we call it uh, evening diversional in the village. Uh, what time do we blow the conch shell, which is the warning, hey, it's time to, to get into your homes for your family prayers, to, for example, uh, what are the penalties if someone is caught stealing someone's pig or chicken or someone's taro? What is the penalty if you get into a fight? And all of these laws, uh, civil matters are handled at, at the village level. So the chief council is tasked with how do we solve this and how do we make it so that there's a cohesive unit of people living in this village because you're talking about two to three hundred maybe five hundred people in a village and we're, we all know each other in some some form or fashion we're, we're also mostly related and so it's important to have a cohesive approach to solving these problems and so i would go sit with my dad and and my dad was was an orator and so he spoke on behalf of what we call the paramount chiefs. And so I would sit there and I would listen to him. And I mean, he eventually became a paramount chief, but I would listen to his feedback. And the way the village council arrives at decisions is, is a general consensus approach. And so if you think about that, not a decision is not made until everyone agrees to the solution. And so these meetings can take hours and sometimes days and perhaps even weeks to arrive at a solution depending on the complexity of the problem. And so in those meetings, I learned the idea of humility, the principle of listening carefully and understanding and trying to discern what is, what is the meaning behind someone's words. And most of the chiefs obviously know each other, so they're looking for a perhaps a misalignment between the words and the actions of a person. I really thought my father was uh, a huge uh, giant uh, of a man in terms of his oratorial skills. 
I, I once used this word. He, so he's, he has a perspicacious kind of a personality. He just was able to discern so quickly the, uh, the intentions of a person. And so I enjoyed and loved that about him. I adored him so much because he wasn't a, a physically strong person. He walked with a limp for, for the majority of his life. When he was about 12 years old, they had Peace Corps nurses and medical personnel in the islands, and they were administering the TB shots, tuberculosis shots back then. And apparently one of the nurses stuck him in, on, on his uh, backside and, and st stuck his uh, sciatic nerve, and it pinched his right leg. And so his foot wasn't, he couldn't step down completely flat on the, on the ground. So when he walked, he always walked with a limp. And so people teased them, you know, kids teased them, and he wasn't always physically strong to do things. But man, he, he accomplished things, and he was able to get much done through his uh, or, orator skills. And so I watched and I learned it from him. But in those village councils, you, you listen, you talk, you talk things out, the difficult stuff. Uh, you ask questions, you challenge the norms of the day, and you challenge the mindset of people. And in the end, you walk away and you go, well, okay, so we had a, we had a discussion. And sometimes it's frustrating, but in the end, a decision is not made until a general consensus is met. And so that's how village life was set up. My father essentially adopted that approach in dealing with our family. And, uh, but at the same time, he also understood the church's position of him being the head of the family and the priest at home. And so he, he oftentimes made sound decisions based on the feedback from his children and his wife as well. So that's, that's really what an all encompassing look at uh, village councils. That, that's interesting. And I think, you know, this council approach, you know, it, it's taught a lot in, in the church setting that many listeners might not be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints church setting that many listeners who aren't members of that faith might not be familiar with. It's different than a meeting. It's this whole idea of coming to a, an approach of getting all the input of all the members of that council and coming up with a consensus, considering that every member of that council has an important voice. And I think there's some great pros to that. What were some of the things that you can pull out of that as good tools that you've learned to apply in your life to get the input from the people around you? So clearly the one element that the church's setting brings in these council meetings is the spirit. All right. So relying on the Holy Ghost, relying on the spirit to lead and direct your thoughts and your conversations. Uh, that's not always the case in a, in a civil setting like a village council because you're, you're bringing up people's wisdoms or, or thoughts and biases in those discussions. Rather in a, in a church setting with a council, you're, you're having these discussions. You are challenging each other's mindsets and perceptions and, and thoughts. But in the end, you're also trying to rely on that feeling, that conduit of clarity, perhaps, that comes from the spirit. And in the end, what you agreed on as a, as a council may, may not necessarily be what the spirit might be. And so you have to constantly rely and, and feel, I guess, trying to grasp at that tangible essence, that emotion of, now that feels right, and then therefore you act upon it because that, that's the confirmation of the spirit. So bringing my background in, in, in that general consensus approach and then putting it in a, in a church setting with a council, yeah, that there's a need for everyone to agree, but that agreement is always predicated upon what does the spirit dictate, which essentially is what does the Lord dictate. And so taking the, the, the position of, this is not our work. We are instruments in his hands to work. We must and ought to be always listening and following the counsel of the Spirit. So I, I think in a, in, a, in a church saying that is one of the council members, if you really think of it that way, is the Spirit, right? A, 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 perhaps the most significant member of the ward council, the bishopric council is the Spirit. So how do you then take that to a, temporal setting and still apply those those same philosophies in an environment where you want to have that best decision made where people might be resistant to some spiritual input or or you have different spiritual you know guidance or or backgrounds which i think that a lot of spiritual philosophies whether it be buddhism hinduism 
uh, Islam, they have similar kind of faith traditions. How do you then bring people together where they can bring their practices to do something similar? Because I think there's value in bringing people together. I did some research on building community in a multicultural environment. And some of the the biggest outliers were that we're so, in the United States culture, we're so afraid to talk about religion that we end up silencing religion as a culture completely. And so I think what you're talking about, we can, if we learn to talk about it more, we could even invite those discussions to make better decisions in our organizations. And what are your thoughts on that? We can approach temporal matters and even in a business setting and apply religious principles without necessarily identifying them as religious principles because they are spiritual elements. The, your makeup uh, well, I'll speak for myself. My makeup as a, as a person is a culmination of temporal and spiritual experiences. And so I can talk and I can apply spiritual and religious principles in a business setting and without necessarily identifying what they are. Because I go into a meeting with this understanding that we all want to accomplish something, whatever that task is. So what is the purpose of the meeting? What do we want to try and accomplish? And what strategies and tactical activities are we going to execute to accomplish that purpose? Well, if we're all on the same page to doing that, we can bring, I can bring up my own religious and spiritual practices, I guess you call it that, to try and, uh, and, and engender a, a setting of openness. So, for example, if you think about servant leadership, one has to be willing to be vulnerable, to be challenged with your perceptions. And so when you think about diversity of thought, you are also opening up the possibility of being challenged and, and perhaps challenged in not, not, not a very comfortable way. It's rather uncomfortable when you're thinking, man, you know, I really feel that this is the way it should be. And then someone challenges you and then the other three people in the room agree with them. And you go, oh, man, but I thought I had the best idea. And so being able to, to remove that sense of ego and say, well, I'm the manager, I should. No, this, this idea of bringing to the table, does everybody have a seat at the table and have them feel empowered to share their thoughts, their, their ideas, their perceptions about how to accomplish something. That is, in a sense, a religious slash spiritual principle. And so I'm, I'm very cognizant of, of the spirit. I, I do my best, let me rephrase that, to be cognizant of the spirit and, its, and his influence in my life in a business setting, on a conference, or whatever the case might be. And when someone says something that resonates with the way I'm thinking and the way the rest of the team is thinking, then you identify that and say, hey, you know what? Let's go with that. And everybody goes, yep, that's a perfect uh, way to approach that. Then you, you feel, at least for me, you feel that connection to the warmth and the confirming em embracing, I guess, of, of the spirit. Now, at that point, I don't have to necessarily identify that in front of my, my colleagues, but I know that. And if they are also, um, in that discerning mindset, they, they can they can say, "Oh, that was a great." Because at the end, they go, "Oh, that was a great meeting. We accomplished much." And so that's the way I look at it. Is we in today's world don't have to shy away from uh, whatever you, our, our religious philosophies might be and diversity of thought, just as long as we can do it in a respectful manner. And, and like I said, always being humble enough to accept other people's viewpoints and really being unafraid to be vulnerable. And I'm not talking about sitting in a meeting and you know you tear up and you cry, but no, be, being able to sit back and say, okay, yeah, I, my feelings got challenged a little bit on that one, but you know what? You're right. That's what your suggestion makes better sense. Let's, let's go with that. Yeah. I think that it goes back to your thoughts on staying attuned to the horizon, right? What, whatever your horizon focus might be, what's our goal as a team right now? You know, if, if you're so s centered on the waypoint, which is, you know, what's my individual goal, you might miss what's out there on the horizon. But if you're focused on the deep horizon, what is our team goal? You know, the waypoints are ways to get there. And that's how you work as a team 
to get there. And I, I think it's important um, using those things to you know center yourself and make sure you don't get lost along those navigational routes to do it and as a team. So there's, there's value in what you just said. And I think, Rock, one of the things I really have learned to greatly appreciate appreciate about you is your ability to live in this tension of finding the pros and the cons and being uncomfortable until you find the right solution that can kind of mesh out some of these things. So I appreciate that a lot. One of the difficulties of working in a, in a large Fortune 500 company is that you're, you're beholden to different stakeholders internally and externally. So if you're managing a team and you take the approach of a servant leadership, you, you know, you want to be essentially in that, I would say the warm and fuzzy space, right? Always being willing to help your people, push them up, support them, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I use the, the scriptural reference uh, in the book of Mosiah to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those who stand in need of comfort. Now, you can take that in a very literal way, but there's also a, a, a more you know, symbolic approach to, to life in that. But it can be challenging in a Fortune 500 or even any large corporation where you're also trying to meet very real objectives. If you are in a revenue generating division of the company, your goal is to generate revenue and profit. One could make the mistake of trying to separate the two, the profit and the people, but that doesn't have to be, in my opinion. When you help people and support them and recognize that behind each person, behind each woman that walks in with makeup and the hair is all perfect and done, but behind the guy that comes in all bubbly and happy is a person that have insecurities, is, a, is an individual who woke up perhaps not in the best mood, to have someone struggling with their marriages, to have st- someone struggling with self-confidence. Behind each person is a human being with very hum- very real human dilemmas. And so, yes, we have an objective to generate revenue and make sure the company is profitable, but you've also got to recognize that people are fragile beings. And so when you're driven by your upper management to meet sales goals, for example, and profit goals, whatever that might be, I still believe strongly that you can accomplish that through a very good balance of a service approach slash managing with objectives, as opposed to, well, this is the way the company does it. That's the way it's always been done. That's the way it's been proven. Yes, you, you can take that, whatever that is, and build upon it. And I always feel that if you empower the individual sitting across from you at a desk and have them speak about what they think could be a, an alternative solution, number one, you've given that person a space to speak, right? A safe place to, to speak. So they hopefully would feel, wow, I actually uh, said something today in the meeting that was received well. And those transformative moments, even as minute or, or small, you know, compared to the big scheme, that human being, that person has walked away feeling connected to the team slash the organization and, and then to herself or to themselves. And so I, I think that's important. I think that's essential. And, and look, I do the same thing with my children and our family. When we're having these conversations, we have a Sunday night conference call, visit wherever they are, and we encourage them to speak and say something that is perhaps, uh, on their mind, that might always be challenging, but of course it would be something positive. So that's the approach I take on that is um, empowering people to to speak and, and let them know it's it's okay, even if we don't agree, but say something. Yeah, I really like that approach. And one of the common feedbacks I've gotten since I started this podcast has been about, you know, one of the the concerns that some of the listeners have had is that with a servant leadership approach, their fear is that they think they have to be, you know, nice or serve everyone or that they have to get into this place or this mindset where they just have to take care of and maybe overdo it. I think they misunderstand the concept quite a bit is what my, my takeaway is some, with some of this feedback is. And I think that when you, your combination of this idea of service with management by objectives is such a beautiful way to attack this misunderstanding of servant leadership and those that might not be performing at their optimal level and what service leadership can really mean for how we approach people at different levels and what it might mean to take individualistic approaches to people and what it might be to to wait in patience or to encourage by stretching people instead of letting them sit too long in their comfort zone. And I just wanted to ask if you had any insight for or specific examples for people that struggle with this understanding of what that really looks like at that individual level 
to help with this misunderstanding? Yeah, so definitely the research bears out that one of the main challenges of servant leadership is that is exactly what you're referring to. It, it is that ongoing struggle. Where do you find the uh, the balance between serving your people and leading your people? All right. Is, is there even a distinction between the two? Let me engage in this way, uh, Keith. Let me ask you a question. You're, you're a father, yes? Yes. I'm a father, you're a parent, I'm a parent. Is that an exhausting role? Is, yeah. is it tiring? <laughs> Very much. But why is it tiring, do you think? Why is it emotionally and mentally and physically tiring? Because I care a lot and I'm very worried about making the right decision. That is the absolute truth. Servant leadership requires massive capacities of emotional and mental strength because you are dealing with people, people's emotions. You are dealing with the human element, right? You don't see people as instruments, I guess, to accomplish a task. You see them as people that have real issues. And so it is exhausting. And so you, you can take the position of, yeah, I want to love everybody, support them and care for them, that you could neglect the objectives of the, of the team and the company. And that is the danger. That is a real danger in servant leadership. And so my approach is never forget what you're doing. What is the, what, why are we even meeting? And it's one of the questions I ask even in church settings. Why are we meeting so much? What is the purpose of the meeting? If it's not driven by a purpose, then you're just ending up talking about a whole bunch of things. And then part, so a management by objective example would be in a meeting where you actually have these open conversations, a great leader must always bring to the forefront. Okay, This is what we're talking about. Redirect the thoughts because you can't end up talking about a whole bunch of things. So I think one of the, the critical approaches is when you sit down in one of these meetings, the leader should clearly define the purpose of the meeting. What are we going to talk about? And why are we going to talk about this particular object? And then bring up some of the, the the strategies that the company has used or the division has used or the teams before you have used and what has been done, what has been done today to accomplish that task. Clearly list that out and then say, we want to open up to have a discussion on what have we not thought about that can help us accomplish these tasks in, in a more efficient way. See, that's, to me, if I'm in a setting and someone tells me that, and always references the objective. It helps me not only just open up my mind on what I, you know, some alternative approaches, but also keep in mind the reason why we haven't even having this discussion. And the good leaders that I've been around are the ones that always brings you back, brings you back, brings you back, right? Serve and love your people, but always bring them back. Have them focus. Same thing with raising kids, right? Your kids can be so excited about things, but hey, bring them back. Do the dishes. That's what you're here for. I know you love to ch chat and visit with me and to ask me about the food. And but hey, load the dishwasher. Load the dishwasher. <laughs> so I, I I believe that that is definitely one of the dangers. Is you can be num completely exhausted by just trying to love and support your people that you forget about the, the objective. And, and I think that's a good balance you can find is uh, always ensuring that people know exactly what the purpose is of the meeting. I really appreciate that answer. And I think there's also an opportunity with that analogy used with parenting and children. When you know when you know someone doesn't like to do something or they're struggling with something, there's an opportunity to either be a coach or a teacher. Like, for instance, my daughter hates loading the dishwasher, hates it. <laughs> but so I take that opportunity when, sometimes when she's loading it, I'll go join her and help her load it and I'll have a conversation with her. And I use it as an opportunity to team up with her to have a conversation with her that I know she probably wasn't feeling like talking or something, but I know she appreciates that help. And so I get a little bit better of a conversation at that moment because it drops her guard down or something like that. But, so, but, but you helping her, what does that do for her? What does that mean for, her? I guess, better question. I, it shows her that I, I'm not just forcing her to do something. I'm teaching her and I'm coming because I care to support her in that. And I think we got to do that for our teams too. Sometimes we just give them a task and we let them flounder. Servant leadership is keeping that accountability as part of it, but then also caring enough to support them when we see that they either really don't like something mm -hmm. or that they don't know how to do something. You mm -hmm. have to be invested enough to provide the support mechanisms 
whether it's us or other people, to recognize when those things exist. And I think that sometimes we just delegate, but not we're not properly enough, and we set people up for failure, <laughs> or we don't hold them accountable. And that's where. And I've been I've been having this conversation a lot lately. When we don't hold people accountable, I think what we do is we're reading the worst form of what we think is servant leadership because we're actually punishing the rest of our team. Yeah. We're not serving everyone else. Yeah. You know, I, I love using your dishwasher analogy. If you think about that, right, it's, it's not really about loading the dishwasher, is it? No. It's, it's about helping her understand that there is value and joy in doing this particular effort because there's a bigger picture. If you do the dishes, we'll have dishes to eat with, right? And that's, that's the, you know, if you want to call that the objective. But for her, it's also, oh, my dad does this? What? So my dad's words and actions are aligned. Right? There's a synergy there between what you're saying and what you're doing. And a servant leadership is the, same, is the same approach. I mean, yeah, delegate as much as you like, but give them the right tools and, and the resources to accomplish that. But also be willing to do that with them when and if necessary. And then hold them accountable to that. I, I've always found that the, the word delegation, I mean, that we use that often, whether it be in business or in social settings, but delegate with direction. All right. So delegate with direction and give them the tools and the resources to succeed. Not delegate and then, hey, go figure it out. Well, I'm, I mean, there are certain people that have the initiative to do that. But in a, in, if you want to accomplish, really have someone feel good about themselves, is delegate and give them the tools and resources. So that's a huge, huge thing to think about. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, I, I want to circle back. We, we went down a good a rabbit hole there, but I think it was necessary. I want to circle back to the village council because I know you had some good negatives to talk about that I think are helpful for us to tease out why it's so important to get all the voices, but some pitfalls to be noticeable about. And I know that an easy one for us to quickly imagine as you were talking about it early on was that a decision could take days or even weeks to come <laughs> up with. And some That could be a huge red flag to a lot of people listening. Obviously coming to a better decision if we have the time is worth it. But if some of the times we don't have that kind of time to make a decision, so what else? And I, I guess, first of all, how, how do we overcome taking so long to make a decision? And what else could be things that we could use in a council setting that might be pitfalls to watch out for? And how do we sit in that tension to take the good and the bad together and come up with better results by using everyone's voice that we were in our environments? I love that question. It, it challenges my, uh, my foundational approach to life when it comes to making decisions because of, of that upbringing, right? So, so, so think about in the setting in a village. First of all, the, the time, time is not necessarily measured in minutes and hours. It's just, you know, time is time. And so what's the hurry? What's the rush? Okay. So if you take that approach and that's how you've lived your life, it's okay. So we didn't make a decision today. Well, tomorrow's another day. No, we didn't make a decision. We'll do it. We'll do it. So there's always, I mean, I was raised that way. I'll get to it. Eventually, it's going to get done. In a setting where a decision must, not just has to be, but must be made because that decision will help move something forward. And so this is where you start bringing up the idea of the majority, right? And so in a setting where, again, this is just my opinion, of course, where there's not a general consensus met, but the majority has determined that this ought to be the solution or solutions that can benefit the individual and the collective, then the leader, therefore, at that point, should make that decision and bring that team together. Because one of the comments you made earlier, you're not going to please everybody. In fact, it, it's impossible to please everybody. But if there's a chance that you can so let's just use a, so an example. If 10 people are in that meeting and you've gone through this conversation, you've met, discussed, brought up ideas, and eight of them have all felt strongly about this alternative solution and, and you agree with them, the other two, not so much. Well, if the decision is critical to move the needle for your team to accomplish a task because of the objectives, the overall objectives of the company, well, then the leader must make a decision. You can't wait until the next meeting to have a general consensus. So if there's a timeline, if you, the manager or the leader, is accountable to that timeline to deliver the service or the product, whatever it might be, 
And that decision that you're, you're making is more of a majority decision as opposed to a general consensus decision. Then that decision must be made for the good of the company, the good of the individual, of the collective, and then hopefully for the good of the, the two that did not necessarily agree. That is a way to accomplish something and still trying to please, uh, try to appease everybody, I guess. And so the two that perhaps didn't really like the idea, hopefully they'll see the value in the decision and buy into it. And, um, and, and hopefully they'll understand. And then look, in another setting, they might be on the majority. All right. And so that is that understanding that we're not always going to, again, you might want to clarify that from the beginning as well with the, as a, as a leader and say, look, in these discussions, everyone, we're not going to all agree on exactly how something should be done. However, if you're all comfortable with this, in the end, if there is a majority of us that agree that this is the, is the right approach, are you all comfortable with moving forward with that decision? I, I think if you ask that question in the beginning, that should at least set the stage that if you're in that minority, but yet the majority has decided that this is a better way to do it or a good way to do it, then you know, hopefully you can be okay with it. I was just recently listening to a, a podcast episode by Simon Sinek, where he brought on the, the developer creator of Wikipedia, who's really been doing some great work restoring the credibility of Wikipedia. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, just phenomenal. They talked about what the news media needs to do to re- restore the credibility um, that they've kind of lost. And, you know, the news media is continuing to decrease in credibility. And they were talking about this wonderful conversation about credibility that the Example was talked about how you know we don't ever hear the the talk about you know the editors and the reporters talking about what decisions were made to go with this narrative or vice versa and, and how probably the public would really like that and they it would give more trust to the article and it would probably get more ratings because people would be more interested and they would have more context to read from and and that's what he said Wikipedia they're upfront about that's where they get their credibility from is that they acknowledge that these sources. They don't recommend those sources. They're just, this is where it came from. There's yeah. not truth to it. And These are not scholarly articles that's been peer reviewed. Exactly. I gotcha. Yeah. yeah so he's, they're, they're saying their credibility is risen because they're just saying that these are what they are. And he says the media is trying to dress things up that they're not, they're not being upfront with what their sources are. And people can in- inherently see through that is what the argument was between Simon Sinek and I can't remember his name. I'll have to look it up, but I'll, I'm going to throw a link to this podcast into all you listeners because it was fascinating for me to listen to this discussion about credibility because credibility is really important for leadership, especially servant leaders, because mm-hmm. if you're not credible, you're not going to be a servant mm-hmm. leader. I promise you that right now. And um, I was thinking as Rock was talking, I think that leading up front with talking about what you're going to say and maybe even providing an avenue of when you present your decision to the board of trustees or whoever, maybe even acknowledging we had these concerns from some mm-hmm. of our members of our team, but we thought it was best to go forward with this decision because of such, such, and such. I think if you acknowledge the people on your team in that manner, you'll even have a better support for your full team, even so in a proper contextual setting, depending, you know, not, you know, you don't want to create too much doubt in your decision. I understand some of those decisions you have to make, but I think if you, do it in a in a teamwork environment and you built that credibility your team with transparency i think you have an opportunity to create an even bigger trust environment in your team setting if you work through those decisions together and you move forward with a, a greater degree of trust and credibility that's huge keith in fact i'm going to adopt that by the way uh you know acknowledging the acknowledgement in the beginning or the forefront of any any conversation and then the admission right that this is not a perfect process. It's okay. It's okay to admit to that. It's okay to also say, listen, we brought this decision to you, but we didn't have a general consensus. It's okay to say that. Uh, allow your people to be recognized. Even the, you know, the dissenters and you know, those who didn't agree say, yeah, we, we didn't agree on this 100%, but we felt the importance of, of making a decision by virtue of, of what is required of us as a team. So I think that's absolutely huge. Yeah, and you never know. Maybe the urgency behind that decision from the board of directors or board of trustees, maybe that urgency will wane when they see there's a little bit of hesitancy. Maybe they'll be like, you know what? Why don't we take another week to sit on this decision and think about it some more? Because when you'd address that hesitancy, when you're honest and open about some of the things that are going on in your team, 
If you've built that trust and credibility, they might say, let's sit on this for a little bit. We'd rather do it right and get it right than make a mistake on this. That's I appreciate your candor. Let's get it right. So I, I think there's some opportunity there to increase the way you work with a team and the way you work up and down you through your organization. And I'd like to stop for a moment and offer our challenge for this episode as well, based on that, is think about how you work in those team settings like Rock has said. How do you set your the tone of your meetings? Do you let the people know that your the all their voices matter? Do you set by leading letting everyone know what the purpose of that meeting is? Do you talk about what the tone of that meeting is going to be? What is there an agenda for those meetings? Think about your meetings holistically. What what is the environment of that meeting? Do people dread going to those meetings because it's just another time suck where they just know they're going to the black hole of <laughs> meetings? So think about it because that's if you're not aware of what people think of your meetings, you probably should do some investigative work no, in no. your organization because you need to know if your meetings are productive or not. Because if they're not, people are just coming with their worst ideas. If your meetings are run right, they're coming with curiosity. They're coming with good ideas. They're coming ready to build something great. But if not, they're coming complaining ahead of time, and that doesn't foster great crea- creativity. That is truth right there, Keith. If, if, you're, if your team members are going into a meeting already with a sense of dread, that is a tough position to move from and, and trying to build a, an exciting and happy meeting and productive meeting if they're already going, going into it with that sense of dread. So you're absolutely correct, setting that stage right at the, at the beginning and also set the expectations as well. So I totally agree with that. And, and I really want to tie it back to the village council scenario. All right. So in those meetings, I've heard whoever's bringing up the topic. So they, they, they sit around in this, in this circle in the hut. And everybody takes up, we, we call it the poles. I mean, the, the, the hut is, is, the roof is held up with poles. And so it's, it's an open setting. There's no obstruction between the speaker and the, the person. I mean, there's, it's a circle, right? Or, or it's a, it's a kind of a, an oval shaped hut. But there is visually, I can see everybody. The chief can see everybody. They can look at their eyes, look at their faces as they speak. And so there's something to be said about that, being completely vulnerable that way, to be open that way. Secondly, everybody gets a chance to speak. Even if they don't have anything to offer, they will say, I'm good, right? And then thirdly, everybody gets a chance to decide. And so it's, it's not a vote. It's you go around and say, you know, how, how what is your uh, feeling or how you, and so every, everything's driven by that. So there is a sense of, uh, I belong in this conversation. And so I would sit there next to my dad and I would, I would hear my dad, you know, he'll, he'll look around, I'll, I'll see him look around and then he'll kind of nod his head and then he'll say something. And then in the end, he goes, that was, that was a great meeting because we we're able to accomplish something. And they, and they feel, I mean, these men are obviously imperfect people, but they, they do, it's an ancient tradition, but it's a working. It's a workable tradition to a unique setting in that in that village in that social structure, right? So for that for that village setting, that that approach to solving problems makes perfect sense. It's such a beautiful tradition too, and I think you know all these years later, we still have so much to learn from it. And you know, I love how Rock addressed it and brought it to us because it allows us to sit in the tension of what's good and what's bad. And I think for so many of us. We are so quick to either take the good or focus on the bad, but in all things in life, there's opportunity to sit in the tension of the good and bad and find the great, because that's where we get out of our comfort zone and find the great. It's where we sit in the tension of the good and the bad, because sometimes there is some good and sometimes there is some bad, but we don't find a way to find everyone's voice until we sit in the tension of the good and the bad, because that's when we realize some people see the bad and some people see the good. But we have to sit in attention to see both sides. And I, I think Rock, you're such a, a wonderful example of that. And I learned so much every time we talk because you do it just naturally. And I, I just, that's something I'm trying to practice more and more. Well, any final thoughts to wrap us up and close us up today? So there's a, a, a Samoan saying when you've been sitting in a meeting, because we normally will sit cross legged, sitting down on the floor. And uh, again, 
if you didn't have chairs or you'll sit on the floor, but you sit on these mats that you weave and you, you weave the mats and you, that's your flooring and you sit on the floor and in these long meetings, your legs would cramp up and then you're like, oh man, I got to stand up. So there's a saying, I'll just say the word, in, the phrase in Psalm more than I'll translate it. So the word vivella means hot and fala is the mat. So the mat is hot, essentially, meaning that you've sat for so long that the mat is hot. You, you've, you know, you've sat and heated up the mat because you've sat for so long. So I often hear that that's the transition to now it's time to end this meeting. And I always found the wisdom in, in approaching it that way and say, it's, it's time to make a decision to do something different because the, the, the mat is hot. And so at some point, even servant leadership, no matter what the type of leadership style you, you, uh, you embrace, you must make the decision. The leader makes a decision. And that's a big, big part in how I try and observe good leaders and how I try and live my life. At some point, you got to make a decision. And the decision will help move forward or move the needle forward uh, that the team has to do something the next thing. All right. We can spend a whole lot of time making you know, warm and fuzzies and sit around and, and talk about wonderful things. But in the end, one has to make a decision. So I think if I could take any lesson from my upbringing, my cultural heritage, and then combine it to what I've learned and, and embracing management by objectives is, yes, let's build a consensus or do our best to build a consensus. Never forget the objective of why you're trying to, uh, why you're even meeting. But at the same time, the leader must make a decision. I love it. Thanks so much. And I'll just leave with this one final saying because I think it just brings us full circle is eventually storms will come to every person, to every organization, to every family. And all good mariners know when that storm comes, keep a steady eye on the horizon. Just as Rock has taught us about life on that storm, keep a steady eye on the horizon. And that only happens when the leaders set those objectives and continues to lead us through them. So, you know, it's good to take care of your crew so they're ready, they're trained, they know their positions well, and they can help you keep the, st- the ship steady on moving towards that horizon. But you have to help guide it that way. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining us on another episode of the All Might Be Edified Discussions on Servant Leadership. And have a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.